So from here, we go on to something very important. I mentioned it already earlier, which is the study, the situation of theatres in the EU member states, which is part of the European Theatre Initiative mentioned by Commissioner Gabriel and by Barbara Gessler yesterday. So um, for this study, we are more than pleased to welcome the researchers Clementine de Boeuf from Kia and Rasa Gustav Taite from PPMI. Welcome. And before this, we would like also to inform the participants from the guest list and on the live stream chat uh, on the live stream that they can uh, start asking already questions using the Q&A tool on Zoom. Hello. Oh, uh, sorry. Hello. Okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. I am Rasa Gustavtaite from uh, PPMI, and I'm glad uh, today with my colleague Clementine De DeBoeuf from uh, Kia to be presenting the study. And uh, the study will be implemented by PPMI, Public Policy and Management Institute. Uh, in cooperation with uh, KEA, which is an international policy design uh, research center specialized in culture and creative industry. And um, the purpose of the study is to provide a comprehensive mapping of the social and economic profile and impact of the theater sector in EU member states. The study has several specific objectives. And the first one is to make relevant data available, which will bridge the knowledge gap about the theater sector. And in particular, we're gonna be looking at the uh, data related to socioeconomic situation and overall picture of the sector, data about the reactions of theaters following the COVID-19 crisis, and data on the educational aspect of uh, theater professionals. In addition, the second objective uh, seeks to highlight best practices created and displayed during the COVID-19 crisis. The study also seeks to facilitate action at European level, as well as cooperation between organizations and artistic companies. And finally, it seeks to provide recommendations uh, um, for policy, input for policy recommendations and follow-up at European level. And um, in terms of the scope of the study, uh, my colleague from KEA, Clement Clementine, will present uh, a bit more about it. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation to present this study, which is actually just kicking off um, now at the European Theatre Forum. So with you now, I'm going to delve a little bit more into the scope and what aspects we are going to be uh, looking at uh, in this study. To start with the profile and the role of theatre uh, and theatre sector in the EU. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please, Rasha. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, of course, uh, well, we, we will study all stakeholders involved in the theatre value chain. And uh, what preliminary research has shown already is this flourishing ecosystem that uh, um, theatre uh, has with a great diversity of stakeholders from artistic to technician and administrative um, workers. Uh, the strong link, of course, and it was already mentioned uh, in the introduction, the interaction with the audiences in this common space, uh, in this common live moment that we experiment in theatres. And of course, the, the intersection between these core activities of creation, of production, dissemination and exhibition of theatre plays with uh, supporting activities, um, education, the preservation archiving phases, advocacy and representation of the sector as well, um, copyright management and funding and legal support. So we are going to look at the social economic profile and the impact of the theater sector in the European Union, um, starting with, uh, if you move on to the next slide, the importance in terms of uh, economic, in economic terms and a number of companies that we see that the performing arts sector, just here I'm uh, opening a little bracket that it's very difficult to single out at European level, uh, some uh, specific data on theater. So now here in this slide, I speak about performing arts at large. Um, so we, we have seen that in terms of number of companies, the performing arts sector is the largest uh, among the CCS, the cultural and creative sectors in Europe. Um, 
that uh, there is a growing employment and that we're employing uh, high, highly qualified people, uh, most of which are artists. Um, saying this, uh, it's also possible at some in some European countries, and we need to dig more into that in the study, um, to uh, find out specific data on the socioeconomic relevance of the theatre sector. Um, and of course, we, can, we, we already know that it's contributing uh, at city uh, and a more rural uh, level to the local attractiveness and cultural vibrancy. And if we move on to the next slide, we, we are already, uh, well, we have researched a preliminary, uh, the labor conditions and some psychosocial risk associated with the theater uh, sector. So what, what we are witnessing is a sort of shift from a more traditional model uh, that is uh, based on owning a venue, creating a, we, our own production with a permanent uh, ensemble towards uh, something more, uh, let's say, non-standard uh, or a typical working model where a companies sell productions to venues, uh, they have fewer permanent artists, they work more on a project basis with freelancers and short-term contracts, which also has some implications, uh, and we've seen that in the COVID crisis in terms of higher risk of losing uh, jobs or incomes and, and social security protection. Uh, what we can also say is that there is quite a low bargaining power of artists towards some uh, traditional gatekeepers um, and that can lead to unfair compensation for creators and performers as well as some disparity of treatments uh, across the European Union in relation to social security including uh, yeah, the lack of information about taxation of VAT regimes and I'm sure in this audience, in our audience today we have organizations that are very specialized on, on this and that have highlighted this issue uh, several times. Um, if we move on to the next slide about the characteristics of the workforce. So as in the cultural and creative sectors in general, it's quite a young workforce uh, with an increasing number of professionals uh, that we've just seen are operating outside traditional forms of employment. There is quite a growing number of um, companies which does not necessarily translate in uh, employment opportunities, unfortunately, for uh, a workforce that is uh, highly educated, as I just mentioned. Um, Moving on towards uh, the topics of diversity and uh, gender balance uh, in the theater environment. Um, so it's, well, it's, of course, this topic is very important to, towards the mission and the relationship that theaters have with their audiences. Um, so it, this means uh, access to theater education for people from all walks of life in the first place, but it also means making performing arts programs accessible to, for instance, disabled artists or disabled audiences um, so this theme of, of inclusion and access to theatre for all is also going to be studied in, in the research. Um, in terms of gender balance, uh, well, I, I, as in the rest of the cultural and creative sector, it's still something that needs to be achieved at different, achieved at different levels, uh, from the creation to the managerial aspect, the statutory level of a female artist, and as well as in terms of artistic choices. Um, yeah, if we move on to the next slide, it's um, well something that is not on this presentation but is going to be part uh, of the study, of course, is the social impact of theatre, um, the, the, the cultural participation as a shared space. Um, as Maria Gabriel said, the theatres are places to exchange and to debate. Um, so this uh, study is also going to uh, look more particularly at the impact of theatre uh, on, on the social perspective, uh, representing, of course, the great variety and great diversity that we have in terms of languages in Europe and different ways of engaging audiences uh, and improving as well some, some social aspects like mental or physical health. Moving now to a different topic that is also core of this study is a sustainability aspect and I'm very, I'm very curious to hear uh, what uh, will be said in the next session. Um, so theatres uh, are, are moving towards more, um, more sustainable practices in terms of content, exploring, for instance, the topic of climate emergency or waste or other uh, environmental concerns can help raising awareness uh, within the audience about the responsibility that we have and possible future solutions to uh, this challenge. Um, but of course, we know that uh, theaters have quite an important environmental footprint. 
Um, so it's integrating, uh, it's about integrating environmental concerns in different parts of uh, the theater productions, like the, for instance, the costumes or the electrical uh, gear. Um, so well, we, we know that we need more training and awareness raising about this. Um, so it's quite a timely moment to rethink operations, maybe in this, uh, in this challenging and opportunity times. If we move on quickly to the next slide, another aspect uh, to study and uh, to research is the educational pathways of theater professionals in Europe. So we know there's quite a number of broad diversity of courses. There are universities, of course, but some we have a long tradition in Europe of, of theater schools. Um, the idea is to get an idea of what disciplines um, are taught uh, for future theatre professionals and also to research um, the, the way that these uh, educational uh, institutions prepare uh, young professionals for a new uh, life and providing them with a, a safe space to rehearse, to create, and also some opportunities to uh, internationalize and get in touch with other professionals uh, from other European countries and beyond. <laughs> Um, so now moving on to the, the key challenges. So, well, the key challenges of the theater sector have been, uh, let's say, uh, highlighted even more in this uh, recent uh, coronavirus uh, crisis. So it's about, first thing, the social protection, um, the um, social protection and the working status of theater professionals. So while the crisis has shown the lack of social protection due to the statutes that I mentioned in the beginning of this uh, presentation, um, there is, as I said, also a severe disparity in social security taxation and fiscal treatments uh, across Europe. And so the response to, to the COVID the crisis would be about safeguarding this, the livelihood of our artists, the companies, the technicians, and all the organization that revolve around this theater sector. Um, internationalization, uh, of course, well, theater is very language based, although there are some, um, some interesting initiatives that are uh, cross border in, Euro in Europe. There are some difficulties in co production, in production, and in the circulation uh, of, um, of performances. Uh, and now the travel conditions have worsened and, and endanger this mobility, which is quite important for the theater sector the mobility of not only artists and performers and also um, uh, other uh, theater professionals. In terms of adaptation to the digital shift, well, they are already, the theater sector is already uh, creating and experimenting with uh, digital forms and new technologies. Um, but this uh, cross-sector experimentation remain quite uh, still a niche uh, because there are some training and some skills to be uh, acquired to be able to engage more in this cross-sector collaborations. Uh, so the moving into the digital sphere is about finding new business models that the crisis has still uh, well, not yet shown a concrete or a sustainable uh, new business model. Yeah, if we can move on to the next slide. Sorry if I'm speaking quite quickly. We have uh, a lot of um, a lot of content to to share in a few minutes, but I'm sure we can go back to some some of the aspects in the question and answers. And um, to finish with the challenges, uh, of course, access to funding, uh, whether public or private. With the crisis, it's likely that some of the budgets are going to decrease. So. Um, uh, we'll see how uh, this impacts the theatre sector and, uh, and, and how to ensure a continued support both for the supply and the demand of theatre content. And finally, the theme of inclusion and access uh, to theatre for all that was briefly mentioned before, taking into account all aspects of the audience experience and also how to see how theatre uh, interacts with other uh, arts or cultural forms uh, and is placed in, in the in the consumption patterns of Europeans and uh, to see how the COVID-19 with the closure of uh, theaters is, is also impacting the relation with the audience and to see how we could avoid social exclusion for, from so, some parts of the audience. And finally, the, the famous uh, impact of the COVID-19 on the theater sector. So we've seen uh, how uh, interestingly the sector has been adapted 
uh, both moving to digital in the first phase, raising also some, some concerns or issues about how to monetize these digital performances and how to create new partnerships with uh, other types of organizations like uh, streaming. Um, theaters have been uh, hardly hit. Uh, I think there is no need to remind how um, this uh, crisis has been affecting the theater uh, sector. There, it's brought uh, some uh, very critical um, economic and social issues. Um, so also the disparity and the fragmentation across the sector shows different types of impacts. Uh, for instance, for smaller uh, companies or smaller theaters and the independent scene is quite at risk. Um, we'll see how the, the crisis also impacts um, the dependence or the impacts to the mobility um, and the, the touring in, in theater, and uh, as well as study how the, the organization of the funding at national and at European level will maybe touch differently different types of structures. So this, these are important aspects to be considered when looking at the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the theater sector and ecosystem. I will move briefly on this uh, response and adaptability of the sector. So I said there was the moving into digital and then, of course, preparing for um, new types or, or uh, new forms of performing for reduced audience or how to uh, respect the sanitary uh, measures with the social distancing from the audience within the audience and between the audience and the artist and between the artists themselves. Um, so we've seen a plethora of very interesting, resilient uh, initiatives in the theater sectors um, that uh, we will continue studying within this, uh, this study, within this research. And finally, the policy response, both at the national, uh, local and regional um, level, collecting societies and trade associations have put forward measures to support the sector with some examples that you can see on this slide, like uh, emergency funds or ed packages, subsidies, grants, compensation measures and digital, digitization, distribution of content um, information as well. Um, at the level of uh, European institutions, we have general funding uh, re response instruments that are listed here, like Corona Response Investment or the Next Generation EU or REACT EU. Uh, funding programs. Of course, as already mentioned by Maria Gabriel, we have this Creative Europe program now with a new uh, funding envelope or the CCS, the Cultural and Creative Sector Guarantee Facility that is going to adapt as well and be more flexible and accessible for cultural and creative sectors. And then for ongoing projects, we had the deferral or the extension of the deadlines, as well as information sharing between uh, among the sectors, um, like the, the platform that was already mentioned. Um, more specifically, uh, in the, for the theater sectors, it was already presented this uh, cross-border distribution and performing arts work call, the present study, and the present uh, forum and European theater initiatives. So, I will stop here and let the Russia present the outline of the research program. Um, okay, so I'll talk a bit about the key steps planned in the implementation of the study. So uh, under, this, uh, under the study, we will undertake several tasks and the first one will be desk research and literature review. The main purpose of this desk research will be to um, Collect, the, collect all relevant data already available on uh, the existing uh, support measures for theater sector in EU and uh, some other countries, as well as uh, to collect data on the measures undertaken by government and theater organizations in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and also collect data on the educational aspects. Um, following this, we will conduct an interview program. It will be a two-level interview program, meaning that uh, we will conduct uh, 10 interviews at EU level and 50 interviews at national level. And uh, these 50 interviews will be conducted in the scope of our case study program, um, as we are going to select 10 countries for more in-depth analysis. Um, for these uh, case studies, as I mentioned, we will implement 50 interviews, meaning like five interviews per country, and we will aim to interview 
some uh, theater representatives, representatives of uh, performing arts associations, as well as uh, um, policy making representatives of policy making institutions. We have not selected the countries um, uh, for the case study analysis because uh, we still need to refine the selection a little bit because our our uh, criteria for selection are uh, balanced geographical scope, uh, as well as the extent uh, to which uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic hit different countries. So we will need to see uh, before starting the data collection phase, which countries to select concretely. And following uh, this, we will also carry out a survey program. It will be the primary tool to collect uh, this quantitative socioeconomic data on the theater sector. And um, all this data, qualitative and quantitative, uh, will feed into a comprehensive mapping of the socioeconomic situation of theaters in EU member states. And uh, the result of the study will, will be a study report uh, with conclusions and policy recommendations, which will be discussed in a validation workshop. Uh, where the prelimin preliminary results will be uh, validated uh, and discussed uh, between the representatives of the commission and the stakeholders of the theater sector. And we believe that uh, a key to successful implementation of the study is stakeholder engagement. So we think it's quite uh, a good opportunity to just emphasize uh, places where we will need that stakeholder engagement. And uh, primarily, like even in the desk research stage, uh, we may outreach to stakeholders to access relevant data because uh, the availability of comparable data internationally is quite limited. So we'll need to uh, check national statistics and maybe send inquiries to national level organizations about any data they have. Then obviously our interview program engage is aimed to engage with stakeholders. And as I mentioned, it will be a mix of EU level interviews with, with uh, representatives of uh, EU level associations as well as um, representatives of a commission. And we already mentioned interviews at uh, countries. And uh, also very important is the survey. The launch of the, the success of the survey will very much depend on the engagement of stakeholders and their willingness to fill in the survey. So uh, we will uh, put all effort into disseminating the survey as widely as possible. And then also another element of stakeholder engagement is the validation workshop where the results of the study, the preliminary results will be discussed with some uh, key theater experts. So that would be, the outline of the uh, tasks uh, planned. And uh, since we are just uh, in the process of starting this study, um, I cannot, uh, unfortunately, we cannot say at this point when exactly each uh, method will be launched, each step will be launched, but uh, we will uh, uh, for sure try to disseminate the survey as much as possible. And um, would you, do you have any questions about uh, the study? So <clears throat> there are indeed a few questions to the study. Um, I will pass them over to you and uh, you can uh, answer them, of course. So um, first of all, uh, one of the questions is, uh, will the study also give insight in terms of numbers? I mean, simple numbers, how many theaters are there? How many people work in theater in Europe? What are their backgrounds? Yeah, of course you talked a little bit about this, but uh, let's uh, stick to the first two. How many theaters are there, for example, in the member states and how many people work in theaters in Europe? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, yes, we will try to collect this data as much as possible. Uh, we already identified some sources that we can uh, uh, look into at EU level, at EU level and national level. But uh, obviously, availability of data at national level is um, 
different in each country and there are some limitations to comparability of data, but we will try to assess each data source and uh, look into this aspect. Okay, and at the end, you mentioned the time scale. Um, can you repeat what the time scale of this study is? Or for example, when do you expect to have uh, first results? Mm -hmm. Well, the study is nine months long and we will start to implement it this month. So the study should be then finished in uh, fourth quarter of 2021 or not earlier on the third quarter, but um, it will probably be, it will finish maybe end of summer or autumn 2021. Um, I have a question uh, asked in the chat from uh, Thomas Engel. We learned yesterday that the study will be one of the major communication towards the policy level. And um, he asks if the whole study will be available for all to make comments. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the preliminary findings will be discussed at a validation workshop and the whole study, well, it will depend on the commission, but uh, studies uh, are usually sometimes, well, in, in many cases published online by the commission, but. Uh, Maybe something to add is that we also, we will have two external experts that are going to uh, review uh, the study. So it might not be available directly for comments by everyone for implementation uh, reasons, but as Rasha mentioned, all the different consultation steps aim at taking into account uh, the most inclusive, uh, in, a, in the most inclusive way, different points of view from different types of stakeholders of the theater ecosystem. So uh, we aim at representing uh, the broad diversity of the stakeholders and not to represent one's only point of view. So we will conduct the scientific work in order to be uh, yeah, as inclusive uh, as possible. And these workshops and validation uh, steps are very important for, for us. Okay, um, Tobias Weidt is asking, how do you choose the participants of the study? Uh, well, uh, we have uh, foreseen that, uh, for example, for the interview program, we will develop some, deliver some EU level interviews and national level interviews. So we plan to, at national level, to interview at least one representative of public theater, private theater, um, representative of uh, um, performing arts uh, association, uh, one uh, representative of education pro educational provider, and uh, this will uh, probably be um, we will select them based on maybe their presence within the theater scene in each country. Mm -hmm. Another question from uh, Regina Gul is. Uh, What's what's included in the term you used, educational aspects? I think if I refer to the terms of references of the study is educational pathways. So apologies if I used aspects as a quick uh, word. So it's educational pathways mainly. So understanding uh, what education programs are available for uh, future theater or theater professionals. Uh, where these are located, uh, what sort of topics are uh, taught, uh, and how also these institutions are adapting today to the new uh, reality of teaching, um, mainly uh, mostly online and for performing uh, art forms, the, the challenges of this kind of online uh, teaching. So while well, this is going to be more elaborated, but I think pathways is the, the right term. <laughs> Um, here's another question uh, by Elena Polivtseva. Will there be any focus on multidisciplinary venues and companies which are very active in various performing arts forms along with theatre? Um, I, can, I can start on Sarig and Russia if you want to complete. I think this is one of the 
of the first thing that we had to do also in this study or we have to do is to define or try to define the theater sector and this is quite a challenging task considering exactly this the multidisciplinary aspect and the fact that you have venues that are uh, showcasing not only theater but also other types of performing arts so i think in terms of we'll see how we can uh, put that together but yeah we'll try to of course it's it's the theater but i think we we are going to be inclusive of live performances at large because this ecosystem is interrelated. So uh, that's a short answer, but uh, this is going to be one of the first tasks also to the, of the study to see. I think there are no clear cut boundaries and, um, and we're going to research more and see how we can uh, yeah, also include that aspect that you mentioned. Okay, and the very last question here from the Association of Youth Theatre. Is um, performing arts for young audiences up to 18 year old audiences included in the study and the special reality this part of the sector has? I think uh, maybe Clementine can comment a bit more on that. Uh, yeah, I see. So the European Theatre Forum would like to answer this question live. So um, I think, I mean, yeah, why why not? I mean, we are we still have to to research if you have any material uh, to send us relating to the specificities of theatre for young audiences. That could be very important for us. Maybe particularly in relation to the the social uh, and educational impact of theatre could be very interesting to look at uh, this uh, this uh, aspect. Well, okay, thank you very much. There's also a comment from the audience that um, I would like to share. No, apparently uh, that's it because we are running out of time, uh, and we still have something else to show you. Okay, and uh, then thank you for this dense and, and detailed presentation. Uh, I think we can say that uh, this study is very much awaited by the sector and we will be looking forward to the whole process, of course, and the results. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now, before we take a short break, a very short one, because <laughs> time is speeding up. We want to share with you a message from Belgium about uh, the importance of theater and the performing arts. Milo Rau, the Swiss theater director and dramaturg, I'm sure everybody knows him, artistic director of Antiquent in Belgium, has recently published a book called Why Theater at the Verbrecher Verlag in Germany, gathering many important voices from the sector uh, on the continent. His book gives critical insights as to why the theater and the performing arts are so indispensable today by some of the most influential artists and intellectuals of, the, of these present times. It seemed to us that during uh, uncertain times like these, raising awareness about the necessity of theater and the performing arts seems even more crucially important. That's why he has asked his colleague and co-editor, Carmen Hornbostel, to give you a short presentation of this book. And that's what we will be seeing right now. Number eight, Quixote, Robin Hood, Hamlet. We must not only portray them, we must become them. Number 22, because here, as watchers and as watched, we are all always breathers of the same air, mutual authors of each silence. Number 49. A book you can just put aside, or away. Theatre you cannot. This is the radical power that the theatre has, the suspension of freedom. Number 51. Theatre now needs to become lighter on its feet, examine its large administrative structures, reduce its operational carbon, be more flexible in how it moves between the digital and the live. Number 10, it's not about producing art, it's about implementing it. Number 35, because everybody knows what theater is, because nobody knows. 
The quotes you just heard are taken from the book Why Theater that the Antigent under the artistic leadership of Mila Rao recently published. Usually the answers are given by the making of theater itself, but due to COVID-19, this was not possible anymore in March. So we wrote a letter to more than 100 artists all over the globe and asked for their personal why. The statements you just heard, or the quotes from the statements, are from the Belgian theatre maker uh, Chakri Benchika, the British director Tim Etchells from Foss Entertainment, the French writer Edouard Louis, the British opera and theatre maker Katie Mitchell, the Cuban artist and activist Tanya Bruguera, and Stefan Kegi from the German collective Rimini Protocol. Why theatre? Because it makes the cosmic drama accessible. It makes it proportional to the size of a human being because it sharpens the sense of reality as well as the sense of possibilities. Or as Rini Polish wrote in his contribution to Y Theatre, I need someone to think. Okay, so now we invite everyone to take a very short comfort break and we'll be back at 10 o'clock for the session on environmental sust sustainability and EU culture policies greening the theater and performing arts sector. See you soon.